businesses and offer protection, which really meant they were offering protection from themselves, so if they didn't, you know, go along with it. Well, some high mind, there was some, actually some high minder inf infiltration. They came from S San Francisco, but some had migrated over to, to Prescott. Not a lot of them, but a few, enough to be afraid. And of course, the people who worked at that Chinese kitchen, well, they were working for white men, so, you know, that was frowned upon by the high binders. Inside the saloon, when they heard the explosion, Barney Smith among them, they thought, you know, it was just a, a kind of a ploy where uh, they create the uh, distraction, a big explosion, and then everybody would run toward the explosion, and then they'd run off to the uh, uh, gaming uh, to the gaming tables or the cash register, you know, while everybody's pretending to the explosion, and uh, grab all the money from gaming tables, the cash register. So Barney Smith tells his uh, bartender, Frank Williams, he was a very popular bartender, told him to stand guard by the, by the tables and watch the cash register. When everything in the smoke kind of cleared and everybody was able to look around and by some miracle, nobody was dead, you know. And so the first thing they noticed was the 25 by 20 foot uh, dining room was demolished. And the power of the blast was so strong that there was a thousand pound oven in the kitchen. That was completely knocked over. Inside the saloon, anything that could be displaced was. Uh, tables, tables were lying everywhere. Uh, glass from the windows was shattered. Uh, linoleum lay everywhere. And bookmark linoleum because uh, that becomes part of the forensic evidence later. The damages in total were about $1,000. And again, that doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, today, by today's standard, that's about $29,000. So it was a lot of damage, and especially disturbing to the, uh, the cabinet proprietors was $300 worth of imported liquors. You know, the, uh, the blast went off, some of the, glass, the bottles just shattered, some hit the ground, so there was booze everywhere. And $300, that's about $9,000 worth of liquor. Then a chandelier fell down that was worth $40, which was about $1,200. And it was pretty obvious what had happened. You know, it sounded, like, it sounded like dynamite, and it was dynamite. But miners that were there going, you know, that really, that, that odor sounds really, smells really familiar, eh, that of dynamite. And sure enough, it was. Later on, as, you know, they started investigating, it was learned that the dynamite had been placed directly beneath Bertha in Cora, where they were sitting and having, having dinner. And so that got, got people to thinking. But by some miracle, neither lady had been thrown for the area. It was almost like they were in the eye of a hurricane. And, uh, you know, of course, at the time, they, they, even, they didn't have any realization that that dynamite had been placed below them or that one of the, both of them may have been targeted. Well. And here, here is the report here that uh, one of the ladies was late up for repairs, but I got, it seemed like it was like uh, just kind of minor, really. One was not even injured. I think it was Bertha who was not injured. The poor Chinese guy, he had a bad wound on one of his legs, but still, considering the collateral damage, you know, it was a miracle they weren't blown to smithereens. So, of course, the big questions were who would do such a thing? Why would anybody try to blow up a perfectly good saloon, one of the top two saloons in Prescott? So an investigation was, was started by this fellow here, Chief of Police Steve Prince. That's a picture of him after the Great Fire of 1900 on Cortez Street. So he was Chief of Police for quite a while. And he started the investigation, and of course the natural place to start was with these two ladies who seemed like they were being targeted because the, the dynamite was placed right below them. So he goes over to Granite Street and starts questioning them and their form their fellow soil dove colleagues, if you will, uh, and didn't take long before evidence started piling up that it was Bertha who was targeted because, well, Bertha not only had a husband, but a jealous husband. His name was William Binkley. He was an employer, uh, employee of the Last Chance Mine out in the Walker District out near wherever Walker is now, somewhere out there. But, uh, and if you're taking notes, it's be a good thing to write down because there's a lesson to be learned. If you're a male, you have a tendency toward jealousy. 
Don't marry a hooker. <laughs> that comes with no extra charge. And I imagine you were already thinking of that. What was the guy thinking? But uh, as you're going to see, that really had very little to do with it. So, of course, uh, Prince goes to uh, Bertha and she says, uh, yeah, I heard you're married. Are you guys having problems? And she goes, no, everything's fine. And they went to William, of course. He said the same thing and asserted his innocent. Well, as the investigation went on, uh, it was learned that some dynamite was missing out of the old ch last chance mine. So suspicion was high, of course. So they arrested him. And finally he caved in. And when he did cave in, he had quite a story to tell. Uh, well, it must have been a really, I have a feeling it was a really quick wedding. But Bill Binkley was in love with Bertha and they got married and he was hoping they lived together happily ever after. But it didn't work out that way because soon after they were married, she goes, hey Bill, guess what? I'm already married, I have a guy. He's in Colorado and he's doing fine. And not only that, you and I will not be living together. So of course Bill was devastated and uh, he started stalking Bertha. Uh, I'm not sure where she lived at the time. She worked on Granite Street, but I'm not sure where she lived, but he started stalking her. It said at her Adobe, many times he confessed this, confessed this. He'd go over there and, uh, you know, get her attention, however which way, and she would always just laugh at him, make fun of him, belittle him. So he would cower away, emasculated, and it got to a boiling point for him where he'd had enough, and he began planning a murder suicide. So he goes to work one day, I guess probably what he did, but he goes over to the last chance mine, like I said, over in the walk district. This is a picture of that, that area. And he knew that dynamite was uh, stored in a cabin there. And I quite imagine this, this cabin right here that you see in the distance. And I cut away at it and got a close up of it. But he sneaks into the cabin, procures, Six six of dynamite with three feet of fuse, one cap at that cabin. Then he hauls it. He goes over to the, uh, the red light district on Granite Street, and he hides it away. And maybe some of you are familiar with this picture. It's, it's kind of a well-known picture. It's at the corner of uh, Granite Street and Goodwin, where the Union Saloon was. And it's kind of well-known because of these buildings here, the cribs, where the horizontal experts would practice their expertise for the benefit of mankind. Uh, so that picture's kind of shown quite a bit. But he took the dynamite and he hid it behind a establishment called the Double Decker. And I'm fairly confident that this is the Double Decker right here. It makes sense geographically and it's a Double Decker. And it may have been where Bertha works, so Bill may have been thinking of just uh, watching to see when she was in there blowing up the Double Decker. But he, he kept stalking her, and then on the night of June 28th, he sees that she's over at the cabinet. He crawls, I already said that. He crawls into the uh, cellar, puts the dynamite just below the feet of uh, uh, Bertha and Cora, and the Chinese waiter was sta standing there as well. Then he flees probably down Whiskey Row Alley to a back entrance in, in South Montezuma Street called the Royal Saloon, and uh, he just waits. And then 30 seconds after the blast, Kaboom, so like everybody else, he runs toward the sound, thinking that what he was gonna see was his dead, formerly beloved Bertha. Well, he gets there and she's alive. And of course he's flabbergasted and a little bit angry about it too. And uh, turns out there was a little bit of science behind why they didn't get blown up. Remember we talked about the linoleum? It was later theorized that the, uh, the linoleum was so thick at that point where they were dining that when the blast ignited, it went and then out like so. And, uh, you know, like I said, like, it was like they were standing in the, in the eye of a hurricane. And uh, so he runs there and he sees Bertha's alive. And he later said, well, my plan was when I saw her dead, I was going to follow, follow her into the unknown. He had some laudanum with him enough to take care of the... Uh, to, to do that, to commit suicide. But he sees her alive and then now, now what do I do? So he just runs and hides. He actually said later that his plan was, was to uh, put the dynamite there, stay with the dynamite and get blown to smith smithereens with her. Well, he <coughs> that was 
a good choice to go with laudanum. Because <laughs> he would have been gone and Bertha would have been, where'd Bill go? So he was still angry about uh, what Bertha did to him, you know, that uh, she, she hurt his feelings, you know. And so after he was arrested, he goes, yeah, I know what I did was wrong, you know, blowing up the saloon and trying to kill her and whoever was with her, you know, and I know that's bad. But uh, she hurt my feelings and she should be arrested too because she was a bigamist and it was a punishable crime at that time in the territories. But Prince says, no, we're not gonna do that. So the trial, Bill Binkley went to trial and it was really quick. And uh, he was sent to the Yuma Territory Prison. Prison. My uh, research later, after I wrote the book, I, I learned that he stayed there 10 years and then was released. You know, you know how that goes. Nothing ever changes. Bertha, well, she probably just uh, resumed her career as soon as she was able. I uh, really don't know. So Belcher and Smith, you know, they had the costly job of repairing the, the cabinet saloon. They were go-getters. They always were. Uh, and uh, they were back in business in a month. And the cabinet saloon became even more storied because, oh, let's see, about a year and a half later, that's when the baby on the bar story occurred. The baby was placed on this bar right here. And evidence points to the, to the um, likelihood that uh, men did gamble for the right to adopt her. And the legend and the true story are, are quite different, but uh, not that part. That part is, is most likely true. And then, of course, the cabinet went down like uh, every other saloon did along Whiskey Row on July 14th, 1900, 1900, which is also my daughter's birthday, July 14th, as she comes up here at upon cue. <laughs> But uh, the cabinet went down with all the other saloons, but it actually was not one of those that burned down. It was one of those saloons as the fire roared up Whiskey Row that they dynamited to try to get the fire to stop. The story behind that is that um, uh, Barney Smith was in there and he was trying to get instructed people to grab this and that, and take it out to the, to the plaza. And in walks one of the volunteer firemen, Johnny Robinson. He's got 25 pounds of dynamite. And uh, Barney sees him and goes, what are you planning to do with that? And Johnny goes, I'm gonna blow your saloon up. And Barney goes, hell, where are you gonna put it, he says. And Johnny goes, in the ice chest. And then Barney goes, that's, that's be damn bad for the ice chest. <laughs> <laughs> so they blew it up and that's, you know, just like it didn't even have a chance to burn down. Some of the palace remained. When the uh, cabinet set up business on the uh, plaza, this is it right here, these tents here. Maybe you've seen the famous picture of the palace, Bob Rouse Palace, not ashamed of it. That was right here, as you can see. But instead of um, uh, rebuilding separately as the palace and as the cabinet, the two top saloons, these guys were kind of buddies and they were kind of working together already anyway. But uh, they decide shortly after the fire to buy those three lots from a guy named Hugh McCrum, who was a multimillionaire from San Francisco. And they bought lights, lots 19, 20, and 21. And uh, this is Bob Rowell, Bar Bob Belcher, and Barney Smith. And the end result was the palace. You know, this picture here, I think it's probably 19, uh, 1930s, not 1830s. I think I got it right this time. 18, 1930s. Uh, but... Uh, that's Barney Smith there. That's when he was about 90 years old. He's looking very spry. And he had a kind of a sudden death, but he was living just as hardly as could be. But he, after, uh, he uh, out-survived uh, Belcher and Brow by a couple decades at least. And he ran the palace for, for several years until he sold it to Sheldon Dunbar. And maybe you've heard of the Sheldon Dun Dunbar stories. So that brings us right up to date uh, with the, uh, Palace in Jersey Lily Saloon sitting where the cabinet and the palace was at one time. So again, I say, let's go down, oh, take me down to Whiskey Road. And thank you very much. I finish early? I did. Thank you so much. I did want to say one thing. I meant to say it as I was talking, but uh, if you're interested in that colorful figure, Dan Thorne, 
Tom Collins, wherever you are, uh, wrote a great Territorial Times piece uh, about Dan Thorne, a little short biography of him, and it's well worth looking at, but uh, I wanted you to know that. Do you have any questions for me? <coughs> Told you it wouldn't take long. Oh, yes, Dana. <laughs> And did, uh, and Sal was upstairs having a weekly. I could say it from. Are you afterwards? <laughs> and I don't know if you, she was talking about Shell Dunbar uh, shot his wife in the palace. Shell Dunbar was the owner of the palace. And Bruce Fee told me this story. I don't know if he, you were, we were there that day, but Bruce Fee was there sitting by Shell Dunbar. And, uh, I guess Shell had, Shell was up in the office? Yeah. Okay, but she comes in with a hammer or something like that, is what I heard. Uh, Harry, his first wife had been in there. Yeah. And Sally's been drunk for two days. <laughs> so, she was having sex with Harry. And Harry was Shell was drunk with And so she kept texting her way out of the surprise and just came down out of the office and she took a whip to the floor and shot her six times. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, uh, and what, Bruce? She left, and, yeah. and they went back yelling the Yeah, and they, I know they were friends after. <laughs> but uh, Bruce Fee telling me, telling the, uh, Bruce Fee tells Shell Dunbar, hey, this is going to be bad for business, you know. <laughs> any, 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 any questions? Yes, ma'am. And I haven't got to that point in my research yet, but I know what you're talking about. Well, there was a water in there. Yeah. There was a water in the whole front Yeah, yeah. So it was a Montezuma Street, or was it? Where the bank is now, Bank Park. Oh, okay. And uh, my adopted mother and her husband, the Brinkmeyers, owned that building. There was one called the Comet that was in that area, but I don't know if it was that one. No, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got a question in the back. Two things. One, because my dad was still at Sally Dunbar and put her back together. And it was still the film for hospital when the scholar is like really Yeah. So it was very happy. And secondly, you said you tell us when we're not the same bar. And what was the prearranged agreement that I would to check for what? Twenty dollars was it or something like that? Yeah. Well, uh the story behind the, the Palace Bar is, it, when I got here, it was still being debated. Yes, it was pulled out. No, it wasn't possible. Uh, 